Welcome back to part 5 of the Build Your Own PokerBot series. In this video we'll be focusing on reducing exploitability. And we'll be doing this with subgame solving and action selection. So exploitability is a problem in any AI system that plays against humans. For example, in the 90s, chess players would be able to beat top computer AI by playing something they called computer chess, which exploited some of the limitations in the memory of computers at that time. And exploitability is actually a bigger problem in poker because exploiting poker opponents' weaknesses is actually a big part of what makes a good poker player. And we can calculate uh, exploitability by looking at the worst case scenario versus our blueprint strategy. Okay, so the first thing we'll cover is action selection. So choosing the counterfactual best response or the greedy option might seem like a good idea, but it's actually the most exploitable thing we can do. And this is where we choose the action that has the highest regret in our information set. And why this is bad, other players can actually determine the strategy. So if the bot always raises a certain amount in a certain situation, the opponent can eventually learn what kind of cards they have. So choosing based on the distribution or the probability is the better option. This is if it's 90% fold, we fold 90% of the time. And a little something you can add yourself, you can add a small amount of true randomness to your actions. So in game theory, this is actually based off of um, Gary Kasparov versus Deep Blue in the 90s. There's actually a bug in the uh, program and it output random moves and it ended up um, kind of screwing up Gary Kasparov and he ended up losing the game. So. Um, the intuition behind this uh, is a quote from World War II about Americans and is, if we don't know what we're doing, the enemy certainly can't anticipate our future actions. So um, this is something you might want to try out, but uh, not too much true randomness. Okay, so next let's go against playing against biased blueprints. So the blueprint strategy that we develop, um, it's basically playing against itself. So it's going to kind of converge on an optimal strategy. But this is not actually how real players play. And unless we are at a true Nash equilibrium, um, weaknesses can be exploited from these various ways players, pl players play. So for example, if a very passive player or a player who calls more than they should, they can extract value out of a bot by um, calling bluffs more than an optimal player would. Also, if they fold too much, our value bets could be potentially too high. So to deal with this, we're going to play against a, a biased blueprint. So we're going to randomly select a, a different kind of player to play against on each one and refine our blueprint based on that. It's going to make us more robust to various strategies. So how do we build this biased blueprint? Let's say we're at information set here. Um, on the top row, we have the regrets. And on the bottom row, we have our percentages for fold, call, and raise. Now, if we wanted to make a uh, a bias blueprint, one that would call more than it should, what we're going to do is multiply the call regrets by a certain number. Um, in this case, I multiply them by two. We take all those regrets and then renormalize them back into a, a percentage. So now our bot at this point will call more than it should, or uh, it'll be biased more towards calling. And this is how we're going to do this for every single information set. We're going to build uh, a variation that calls more, a variation that folds more, etc. And then when we run CFR, we're going to randomly choose which bot to play against, and then we'll, um, we'll get a much more robust blueprint strategy. Okay, so next we'll go over subgame solving. So when we abstract the full game of poker, we can actually run into problems if we have abstracted it two cores. And this means if buckets are too large, we could be playing uh, many hands exactly the same, and we can run into problems with that. So the idea is we solve a smaller version of the game with only one set of cards. So the fewer information sets means um, CFR can converge on a very good strategy with no uh, card abstraction and a very fine action abstraction. And even with a fast com or a fast computer or some tricks with the algorithm or something like that, we can uh, solve this in real time, potentially under 20 seconds. Now, subgame solving for inf imperfect information games is a pretty new thing. Uh, techniques um, kind of go back to about 2014, so relatively new. 
Okay, so the first thing we'll be going over is unsafe subgame solving. And for this, we're going to go back to Coon Poker. Remember, this is our uh, three card, highest card win game, poker game we made. And right here, we have the blueprint strategy for player one's first action. So this is the very start of the game. And uh, this is the blueprint that we calculated with CFR. So we've got 70% pass, 30% bet for Jack, and so on and so on. Okay, and in this one, um, we're going to solve this uh, sub game where we have a queen and our opponent just bet. And we want to decide, do we call or, or fold? So the first thing we need to do is estimate what our hand, whatever hand our opponent has using Bayes' rule. And we do this by just um, taking the average of the probability. So uh, probability of Jack is 30% divided by the total percentages, which is... 30% for the jack and 90% for the king um, and it's going to give us 25% uh, we can do the same thing with the king it'll give us 75% we obviously don't need to do this with the queen because it's not in our deck uh, we have the queen at the start of the match and what we're essentially doing is building kind of a, a weighted deck as I like to think of it so when we're running CFR in this sub game, we're going to draw a king 75% of the time and a jack 25% of the time. And then we just solve CFR like this. So uh, at the start, we have a chance node. Uh, we're going to be in one and two states where the, either the opponent has a king or jack. And then we, uh, here's our actions and our, our for passing and betting. And we just simply solve with CFR in this sub game. Okay, some uh, quick notes on unsafe subgame solving. Uh, it's kind of similar to how real pokers might make a strategy in a situation where they estimate what kind of hands their opponent will have and weight it more on the hands they're more likely to have. Uh, the problem is, the worse our blueprint strategy is, the more exploitable uh, the subgame solver becomes. And uh, the main problem or why unsafe subgame solving is exploitable is it makes strong assumptions on how the opponent is playing. Um, the opponent can actually possibly shift their uh, strategy uh, to throw off our, our, our unsafe subgame solving. But that being said, it's uh, very safe the higher up the game tree we go. Uh, Pre-flop and flop, uh, we're not making many assumptions based on assumptions. Um, so we could actually be very accurate. Uh, in fact, in Labratus, um, the, the No Limit Heads Up player, um, they use unsafe subgame solving on the uh, first two betting rounds, the flop and the pre-flop. Um, and yeah, again, don't be too afraid of unsafe subgame solving. Uh, it gives very good results in No Limit Poker. It's not, in practice, very exploitable. Uh, but in smaller subgames, it's very exploitable so just be uh, aware of which domain you're using it in okay so now moving on to safe subgame solving and we're going to go back to the same situation we had before in unsafe subgame solving with the coon poker uh, but now instead um, instead of getting the percentages of choosing these actions uh, we're actually going to be looking at the expected value of playing these uh, actions so if Jack plays pass, they have an expected value of negative one per se, let's just say. In this situation, we're in the exact same as with previously. We have a queen, our opponent just bets, and we need to decide which action to take. Now in safe sub game solving, we make no assumptions on the opponent's hand. Um, that means every single hand is played with equal probability. And the goal of safe subgame solving is to have your opponent no better off from deviating to the subgame than they would be into playing the blueprint. And the key idea is that we're safe in our blueprint. We know we're not going to lose on expectation. So if we keep that safety, um, we won't be exploited into an unabstracted subgame. Okay, so we're going to solve with CFR. Now, at the start of every game, the opponent or the villain has two actions that they can take. They can either action one, receive a reward, which is the expected value in the blueprint that we calculated, or they can choose to play into the sub game. Okay, and when the expected value of the blueprint subtracted from the expected value of the sub game is non-negative or greater than zero, 
um, we have resolved this subgame in our unabstracted form. Okay, so the subgame is going to look like this. So we've drawn a random card. For instance, in this situation, it's going to be Jack. And uh, the opponent's going to have two options. They can either get the reward from the blueprint in this bet thing, or they can enter the subgame. And this is what we're going to be trying to balance. Okay, some notes on safe subgame solving. Um, makes no opponents uh, makes no assumptions on the opponent's strategy. Uh, some of the problems with safe subgame solving it performs basically the same as our blueprint strategy. So even if there is room for improvement, we won't be taking it in this safe subgame solving. Um, and there's a theorem made by the um, Labratus guys, and it, it says if the estimate of the opponent's values are at most uh, are off at most delta, then safe subgame solving has most two delta exploitability. Okay, so the next topic we're going to cover is action translation, and this is when we have a blueprint strategy for say bet increments of a hundred dollars, and our opponent plays an off tree action. So example, we only have strategies for bets of 100 and 200, and the opponent plays uh, $170. Uh, what do we do in these situations? Uh, the simple answer is just round to the nearest bucket. So a bet of $170 will be treated exactly the same as if the opponent bet $200. Uh, this is the simple one, but it can actually be exploited. And it can be exploited. Um, basically, an opponent can play a bet of $149. The bot would round down to $100, meaning the opponent will play a call or, or a bet more than they should. And this was actually done in poker competitions where people would play against bots. They would purposely bet these slightly below minimum bets to try and get the most value out of the, the, the bot. Um, and we can kind of fix this by adding randomizations with different formulas. So we're going to develop some formulas. Let's um, uh, define some variables. Uh, we're going to call A the lower bound of the blueprint, B the upper bound, X is the actual bet, and F of X is the probability of selecting A in our formula. So in this case, A would be 100, B would be 200, X the actual bet would be 170, and fx is the probability that we would select the 100 bet. Um, and there's a couple things we want when we're developing this some formulas. If they bet $100, we want to uh, select A or 100 with 100% probability. If their bet is B, then we want to select A with zero probability. Uh, it's pretty much makes sense. Small changes to x doesn't drastically affect f of x. Small changes to A or B don't drastically affect f of x. And also it should scale pretty naturally. So uh, 100 to 200 uh, buckets should be the pretty similar to uh, 1,000 to 2,000. Okay, so let's look at these formulas. First one is randomize our arithmetic. And that's uh, f of x equals b minus x divided by uh, b minus a. And if we plug these into the formula, so say a is 100, b is 200, x is 180. We plug these into the formula and we'll get f of x equals 0.2 or 20% probability. Uh, so this is um, might make sense. We want to choose 80% chance of choosing b, basically. Uh, still has some of the exploitable issues in the first one. Uh, to address this, there's the randomized geometric one. And this is uh, that complicated formula over there. So the, the modern or the, the best one so far is randomized pseudo harmonic mapping, uh, which is this formula. And it basically uses um, some game theory rather than just relying on pure math. So example in our first problem, if someone bet $149, it would actually map it with higher probability to B than A. 
And these, uh, using uh, these action translation techniques uh, have shown to uh, reduce exploitability. So instead of uh, action translation, you can actually use nested subgame solving. So this is if one player plays an off-tree action, instead of rounding to another information set, we solve the subgame at that point. So if someone bets $170, we actually create a subgame as if they played $170 instead of $200 or $100. Okay, so in previous subgame solving examples, we actually looked at the blueprint strategy in order to get the expected value of an action. Now we're playing something off of our blueprint, so how do we do this? So to get the uh, expected value for an off tree action, we instead take the, the action with the highest value at that information set. So we take the, the counterfactual best value and set that as our expected value in the blueprint. Um, so just a quick note, we can't do this with unsafe subgame solving because we don't know the probability of reaching an off-tree action. So we actually are forced to use uh, safe subgame solving in this situation.